I sort of cautioned earlier on um, that I come from a background, or I come to this philosophical sort of discourse from a background of classical antiquity, i.e. the ancient Greek and Roman philosophers, and Eastern philosophy. So a lot of the, a lot of my thinking, I guess, has been formed by those two sort of traditions. I wear this ohm around my neck, which I catch trouble for from atheists occasionally. Uh, it's the symbol of Hinduism, although I'm not a Hindu and I never, probably never will be anything remotely resembling one. Um, I have my little Buddha statue, which is just a souvenir, but people think I'm a Buddhist as a result of that. Um, I don't believe in God. I don't, I don't believe in anything supernatural. Um, but I don't say that there isn't a God or that there isn't a supernatural. I want proof before I'll believe anything. And if you have proof that there is a God, it's not a question of belief, is it? Uh, but absent proof, I don't believe. Now, the reason why I put that kind of silly preamble in there is I just want to make my position clear. One of, one of the most, I, I would almost say popular series that I ever made was a few years back, um, where I sort of challenged the kind of uncompromising, starkly materialistic atheism of people like Dawkins or whatever, um, to, or even the cruder kinds, I guess, like Pat Condell or, um, or uh, George Carlin, where I compared, or I tried to sort of challenge atheists of that ilk, the more, I don't know, aggressive atheists, to go at Hinduism in the same way, or Jainism, or Buddhism, or Taoism. Uh, the series was called Atheism versus India. And I basically was saying, your company, Western atheism is essentially in many ways a reaction against the Judeo-Christian Mohammedan, uh, sorry, Muslim, <laughs> um, tradition of monotheism, guilt-based ethics, teleological view of time, um, first principles, all that kind of thing. But when you try and sort of <laughs> use the arguments that you might use against, say, Roman Catholicism, um, against Hinduism, or at least certain strands of Hinduism, or again, Jain Jainism, even Sikhism, things like that, it's not as comfortable a fit and the objections aren't quite as valid. Uh, having said that, I've been to India numerous times and I'm quite familiar with that part of the world. There's tons of mindless, blind faith. In fact, the overwhelming mass of it is just subscription to a mythology that's every bit as irrational as any other on Earth. That's not what I mean when I say India. Specifically, what I do refer to is the more egghead kind of um, tradition, like, say, the Shankaracharya or uh, the more intellectual sort of Buddhist traditions or um, Tao traditions or things like that. Um, and in particular, the subject that we're dealing with now is identity. And the Hindu, I don't even know if you can call it the Hindu, I would say maybe the Indic or the Vedantic or whatever view of identity is quite different from ours. It's almost a sort of uncompromising um, Heraclitism or uncompromising view of Pantarai, everything changes. The Hindu view of the world and the Jain view, yeah, the Buddhist view, etc., is a wheel. Never-ending motion. Okay, so never-ending change. That's, you know, you can never step into the same stream twice. It's possible one could never step into it once because that presumes an identity exists in order to um, step into that stream once, or uh, that that stream has to exist as an identity. Um, with everything changing, say in, in the view of hard determinism, what becomes of identity in that context? What is identity under a hard deterministic view or a hard deterministic cosmology? I would say that identity has been abolished under that context. There is no identity because everything is a function of something that preceded it and it's, it's 
it's a preceder of something that will follow it. There's never a there's never a proper spot where you can say there's an identity, uh, at least in that kind of pantahai sort of context. But we still live in this world, and we have to put identities on things. Everything, everything passes. Um, omnia exeunt. <laughs> everything leaves at once, at at one point, eventually. Uh, things come at you, you encounter them, they go. <clears throat> All things pass, and yet we look around, and there are things out there. I'm sitting on my back porch. There, I have a sort of a railing here, kind of a thing to keep people from gleeping my bike. Really, when I leave it in, leave it out at night. Um, there's a house behind me that you can see. I'm wearing a shirt. I have a thing around my neck. This is my head. But when you think about that in the context of Pantahrai, or the transience of all things, of all forms, does this head of mine really exist? Is it really an identity unto itself, or is it simply part of the gigantic deterministic becoming of the universe? The constant, constant becoming. What happens to identity? Now, the Hindu view of identity is fascinating, and it's the Hindus haven't quite decided themselves what they make of identity, but there's a number of ways to approach it. Um, and one of my favorites is through the medium of Maya. Maya is the view that what we perceive as the universe is an illusion. Now, in popular Hinduism, it's kind of God as the master puppeteer, who sort of He's sort of the guy who's standing behind all the prisoners in Plato's cave. He's the guy who's operating the projector. He's the guy that ha has the fire that's creating the images that the prisoners see projected on the other side of the cave and are beguiled by. The god Vishnu is the guy who spins this web of Maya to beguile humanity. And ultimately his reason for it is similar to Dante's reason uh, for God's existence and God's creation of humanity. It's fun. <laughs> Um, now, anyone who's studied the history of our species knows that human history isn't all that fun a lot of the time. But again, in the larger scheme of things, all things change, omnia exeunt, so the worst things that ever happen to you, you will get over because they will pass. Even, even an atheist will say this, because death abolishes everything. Um, <clears throat> this is why I can't take certain people's view of harm all that seriously. Omnia exeunt. The worst harm you could possibly encounter will be abolished absolutely at your death. So, what does death do to our identity? What does, what does the changing continuum of everything, of the deterministic, endless becoming, do to identity? But yet we need to live in this world and we need identities as tools to allow us to function. So, I've got a link that I've posted You'll notice that I was younger and heavier when it was made. Um, but it's one of my favorite series. And as I say, I've made a, lot of, um, made a lot of enemies among atheists among it. And I've made a lot of Indian people kind of angry with that series. A, lecturer, or a lecture from a Westerner on Hinduism. Uh, comparing and contrasting. Generally, the people that like it are the more, I would say, egghead of the Hindus. And the people that don't like it among the Indians are the what I would call Hindu nationalists. Like, how the hell dare you tell me about my religion type thing. Well, I'm not interested in debating those people. I'm not interested in debating people who actually believe that Lord Shiva actually exists or that there is a Lord Vishnu up there sort of dreaming the universe into existence. Most Hindus do seem to actually believe that concretely. But there is a critical mass of Hindu intellectuals, and now there's a critical mass of Vedantic or I guess or Indic sort of intellectuals in the West who will discuss things at a far more symbolic or oblique uh, way um, than you expect say an Orthodox Hindu to say to, to discuss. Logic rolled the, rolls the dice himself is saying at this point lan language is starting to fail which is okay because again that's why I bring sort of non-rational language into it. Because once you get to this point and the language does start to fail, you have to start speaking elliptically. You have to start hinting at things. You have to approach things intuitively. 
Um, and inevitably when you do that, it starts to sound like religion. And in many cases, it is religion. I don't have that sort of belief or feeling that a lot of atheists seem to have, that approaching religious traditions is some sort of taboo, some sort of haram that one must not do. I don't fear infection the way that other people do. I believe that I'm sort of capable of withstanding the blandishments of blind faith. Um, so that allows me, I guess, with this sort of belief in my own imperviousness to that kind of thing. And so far, this belief has not been misplaced. Uh, it allows me to delve into things, even like, say, Catholic theology, or in my case, it's mostly Hindu philosophy or Buddhist philosophy, Taoist philosophy, without really being terribly worried about some slippery slope that's going to land me in an ashram somewhere chanting mantras at the feet of a Western guru. I don't... I, I, that's never even come close to happening in my life. And yet, I'm constantly reading the Upanishads. I'm constantly reading, uh, you know, the, the you know all the, the various literatures of the East. Um, so... Religious language kind of helps you deal with these things because after language fails, you have to rely on other tools and those are generally intuitive and that's a minefield, another big minefield because religion is waiting there to ensnare you if you get too caught up in intuitive language, intuitive thinking. But without intuitive thinking, you can't make any progress after language and logic have started to fail. I know that not everyone has has accepted my premise that logic has started to fail at this point, but in my opinion, it has. So you either stop where you are, where logic stops working, or you go further, beyond it. Dangerous territory beyond logic, because what's waiting for you there might be Billy Graham or the Westboro Baptist Church. Do you have the courage to go there? <laughs> My curiosity, as usual, trumps any sort of fear of infection. <laughs> um, link below to my view of identity, or my view of the Hindu view of identity. Maya.